calling all consumer goods, business owners, and marketing professionals. Does planning content ahead of time stress you out? Do you want to run Instagram and Facebook ads, but just aren't sure where to start? If your answer is yes and yes, then our mini course was made for you. It's 100% free and packed with essential tactics that you can implement as soon as today. To join in, visit our website at umaimarketing.com slash mini course. All right, let's get on with the pod. Welcome to the Umai Social Circle, where we talk consumer goods tips to help business owners and marketers grow. We're Karen and Allison, co-founders of Umai Marketing, and we're being joined by Trish Wesovich, food and beverage consultant and founder of Capital Kitchens and Launch Point Culinary Services. Thanks for joining us, Trish. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in CPG in the first place? Okay. Well, I started in Austin um, really as a food writer a long, long time ago as a personal chef and as a caterer. Um, And eventually that led me to lead um, launching a incubator called um, Capital Kitchens. um, And it was for food and beverage startups. Um, And it supported all um, aspects um, of the industry. Um, I owned and operated that facility um, for eight years and sold it in 2019. Still going strong and is an affordable and nurturing community of other food entrepreneurs and a great spot to launch a business from. Um, During that time frame, um, I had the pleasure of working with all sorts of food businesses and beverage concepts from um, artisan food and beverage companies, private chefs, restaurateurs, corporations doing um, R&D and farmers markets brands and CPG startups. And so back then we weren't even using the word CPG really. Um, I guess some industry experts who uh, from Austin were, but in general, not not so much. So it just kind of um, happened organically when um, I had originally launched Capital Kitchens with a business partner. And um, we knew that there was demand for kitchen space, commercial kitchen space in Austin. Um, and we, we weren't exactly sure who all would need it. And the first two clients we had um, basically were CPG brands. And so um, that's kind of how it all started. And the first CPG brand that launched at Capital Kitchens is still going strong. Um, and they have an almost national brand now, and it's called Good Seed Burger. And I still think it's the best burger on the market, vegan plant-based bur- burger on the market. I gotta yeah. try that. I've had it. It's great. Um, that's wild that they were they were your first first. They were person. they had they had started in like um, the back part of Daily Juice, which was a little juice shop on in Hyde Park. And um, I mean, this is a typical trajectory for these CPG startups back in the day. And even still today, they started in that little space in the corner and they had very limited ability to use the kitchen and they use it off hours. And then um, they, they, they couldn't really scale in there. And then when we opened Capital Kitchens, you know, we had this big, huge facility. Well, it wasn't that huge, but 3,600 square feet but to them, it was huge and it allowed them to scale. Absolutely. So I, I lo- you were saying that when you started Capital Kitchens, you weren't really sure if there was a big need or for CPG brands or you thought more who was going to who was going to be your Capital Kitchens mm-hmm. members. We knew that there was a need for shared commercial kitchen space. Um, I had just finished being a part of a startup to go space, which doesn't exist anymore. In fact, it's probably about 10 years ahead of its time because today we all know to go food is is, is, uh, very popular and and necessary. Um, but, But back then, no one had really quite adjusted to the concept yet. So I had just finished going through the process of helping to build out that space. And um, so when, when I realized that that wasn't, I wanted, I had been approached just really literally out of the blue by someone who said, I want to open a shared kitchen. And I knew what that meant. I knew there was one already in Austin. And um, I was just, I just so in love with food entrepreneurs 
Um, I was like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. Let's do it. And that's all it took because just we agreed and then we started pursuing. We were very naive about what we were getting into. (laughs) But I would say that maybe um, that helps me actually be able to relate to some of the food um, brands who launch because they're also usually very naive. And so um, I understand what that means. (laughs) But it was so it was so necessary. I mean, it was yeah. very much needed. Yes. So that's awesome. Uh, you had a, a great hunch, I guess. But tell us more about your consulting business. What, who do you work with? What are the pain points and issues that you're, you're working with your, your brands on? So during the time that I got to work with such a myriad of food and beverage um, types of businesses, CPG and beyond. Um, I, I learned a lot and we learned a lot together. So sometimes my value to someone wanting to enter the industry is that I've seen what works and what doesn't work. I've seen what, what paths others have taken. Um, and so that kind of, I mean, like at, at least, you know, I, I had at least, 60 CBG brands that I worked with in one way or another at Capital Kitchens and probably a couple of hundred other concepts, um, as well as food trucks. We had a huge food truck um, business as well. So um, I've seen a little bit of everything. And, And then my background as a personal chef and caterer, I also was already what I call a product geek on my own. Um, I spent every day at, um, Central Market for 10 years, pretty much. And so I knew who all the distributors were. I knew who all the employees were. And so I just learned a lot about the industry. And all of that now kind of is what um, I utilize when I'm working with clients. Um, When you say you spent 10 years at Central Market, do you mean as a consumer, you just would go every day? So I was a personal chef. Okay. And okay. I would go every morning and shop for my clients, and, and then I'd go to their home and I would prepare food. And I was a caterer, so um, yeah, I just saw. I learned a lot about the grocery industry. I would love every to, day. I would love to be in Central Market every day. That's a dream. <laughs> it was great. It was a dream, really. Um, yeah. Amazing. So you've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of CPG brands. Um, So you must know, what are some key things that you think set successful CPG brands apart um, from ones that just don't grow as fast? Well, um, I think it is if, if, if they can set realistic expectations for themselves, um, that is key. Um, of course, commitment is key. You, you almost have to want to see your product on the shelf above and beyond everything else, but you have to be smart along, you know, along the way and you have to be coachable. That's also, I would say, very key. Um, setting realistic expectations or at least, um, you know, most people don't know what the, those expectations really are or even should be, but by going out and talking to others, um, and then like I said, being coachable and understanding, okay, this is how hard it really is going to be. I'm going to move forward. Um, those are the people that, you know, are truly committed. Yeah, that is so in line with um, a lot of idea behind just like what makes a good client and what makes a bad client. I mean, no, we no bad clients, right? But the good clients that we have worked with are just super open to testing, to learning, to trying new things. And I think that's really important to be open minded in this in this field because the moment you think you know everything, I think you kind of show that you don't know a lot. (laughs) Um, So that's a really, really good note. Um, And you talk a little bit about, we've talked before about the importance of connecting within the CPG community. So can you talk a little bit about that and like what you would recommend uh, places that CPG folks can connect? 
Sure. So a lot of times people come to me and they they want to launch a product um, and they um, have maybe come from a tech background um, and they're thinking food and beverage is easier. Um, they've quickly learned that it is not, or, or they've been, you know, maybe a stay at home parent or a school teacher even, or, uh, uh, have a full-time career on the side, um, and don't know anything about food and beverage. Um, they don't know that there is a very strong network of CPG community here in Austin. Um, and it, and it makes sense because when you're, it's like being in a, a musician, you know, musicians like to congregate with each other and talk to each other and compare uh, where they played or what songs are working on or music. And it's the same with food and beverage. So um, that community definitely exists in Austin. um, And I, there's so much to learn from what others have done. And, and, and I find that people in Austin who've been here a long time doing this are open. will sit down with you and tell you everything they know um, and, and then the new people coming into town um, are, are learning very quickly that that's how it is here. And they, they either adjust and become that way as well and become open, even if they came from a, a community that wasn't that way, that they're not used to it. I'm seeing that they're kind of, they're going, oh, this is a much better way to operate and to function. Like, let's, let's be supportive to each other. So, um, and that community continues to grow. So, it's there, there's so many resources out there that are available um, so that you, you don't really have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. Um, but it, it depends how much someone has available time so that they can go out and make those connections. Right. So, um, you know, was your question like exactly where they can go? You know, I mean, that, that, that's super helpful. I think that that advice to know, to, you know, like reach out to experts, reach out to people that you really admire, reach out to people that have something to teach you. And you'd be surprised at how many of those people are going to be super generous with their time. Obviously don't take advantage of it. Um, But I think that's something we have personally been really surprised about too. It's just like a very open community. And I know that a lot of people aren't from Austin, but, um, even if you're not, you can still reach out to us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, I have a client right now I've been working with, and um, she's been self-producing her product for a while now. And, you know, that's getting harder and she's growing very rapidly and realizes, you know, okay, I need, I need production options. And so, you know, the first thing we did was call someone who makes the same product in another state, not a same product, but a similar, you know, I guess you would normally think that's a competitor, Right. But they really aren't going to be competing very much. We contacted them and um, now they're going to be co-packing their products. So they were super supportive. And then they were like, well, we, we could do this for you and we can tell you how to do that. You know, so um, you just never know. You have to be willing to really go out and start asking questions. And if people close the door, fine. Don't let it discourage you that someone else will open the door. I really, I really love that. And I love that about this community. Uh- the community aspect, you know, everyone is so helpful and it can be CPG is like, can be very confusing. You know, it's like, where do I start? There's not this like clear roadmap. There's so many different channels you can go into. You don't have to go into it's, it's confusing. So wanted to ask you, um, what are the manufacturing options that these food and bevs brands have? Is it straight to commercial kitchen or are there, there are other options? Can you tell us about that? Well, you know, before the shared kitchens were really, um, there were as many as there are now and there are more coming online, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, it was really these brands and I, I mean, I'm thinking legacy brands in Austin, people who've been here 20, 25 years with a product at Whole Foods or Central Market, they literally would go and knock on the door of a, maybe a bakery or um, a commercial space um, that was dedicated to one company or a restaurant. And they would just ask, you know, do you have any space for rent? And so, so many brands launched that way. It's incredible. Um, 
I actually kind of have a, an idea one day. I would like to bring those legacy brands together with the new people on the block just to kind of compare stories and see how things have changed so much. So there are still brands that have launched um, in the corners like Good Seed Burger did in the back of Daily Juice. There are still some of those. Um, and, and finding those can be kind of a gem because then you end up with, if the space is big enough and you can scale to a certain point in there, um, you know, the rent can be pretty reasonable and um, you have your own space with only maybe a couple of other businesses in there. If you don't have that opportunity, if you don't find that kind of space, then going into a shared kitchen is is ideal because you you don't it's not such a big commitment you know um, you can rent by the hour you or you 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 know most of the kitchens have minimums you can get started and you can go a long way or you can even live there you know and make your product otherwise well the idea would be you start in a shared space or sharing uh, or in the corner of another kitchen and then you you know grow to the point where you either need a co-packer or you need um your own facility and so back in the day everyone would always say well you just go to a co-packer but nowadays people are really um a lot of food companies are even those who are with co-packers are kind of bringing it more in-house again and realizing no i'm going to do my own production um there's pros and cons to both um It was so hard to find available space uh, five years ago, six years ago. Really, really hard. It's still really hard, but um, we have now that the industry has boomed and Austin has become really a mecca. There's more opportunities. Uh, There are there are plenty of spaces. It's almost even better to just choose a space that is close to where you live. um, That's more practical. And uh, it takes time to find the right space. And a lot of people don't always take all the time that is really needed to find the right space for them, but um, it's important. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've noticed driving home the there's two new, kitchens right next to me that just popped up out of nowhere. So oh. that's great that they're, they're, you know, solving that issue. Um, but can you tell us more about the pros and cons about co-packing versus using a commercial kitchen or a shared kitchen? Mm-hmm. So when you're in a shared kitchen or using your own facility, you know, you're doing all the labor, you're, a large part of your week is spent in production. Um, And so, you know, people often have other full-time jobs and then at night they're in the kitchen and they're producing product. And after a while that can, that can get pretty hard to maintain and going to a co-packer, you know, is hard to find. It's a long process. It it can, you know, it's usually about a year can be longer to find the right co-packer. And and it's not, you're not going to, find someone to make small batch uh, batches for you. So you, you have to be pretty far along in your business to, to engage a co-packer. Um, there are exceptions and that's the thing. That's why there's no rule book or guidebook for launching a food business. There are exceptions to everything. There's so many variables. There isn't just one path. Um, but here in Austin, we don't really have any small batch co-packers. So, you know, you pretty much have to be pretty far along um, to to approach a a co-packer. Having your own facility, taking your production in-house means you're responsible for a lot. You're responsible for the lease. You're responsible for um, the electricity and the maintenance and... All, all of those expenses add up very quickly. And then you're, you have the labor, you have to create a team and you have um, employees. And so that, that's a big business to manage all of a sudden. Um, so those are the challenges. <laughs> yeah. And so 
a lot of people that are going to be listening aren't to that co-packer stage. So when does a brand know when they are ready for that next step? Like, are there minimums that they should be thinking? Like, I should be selling at least blank to get to that co-packer step. It really, really varies. So like I have a a client now who is launching, like she hasn't, she's not out on the, on the shelves yet, but she's starting with a co-packer. And so the minimums are somewhat small um, and we're having to in kind of invent the process for her product. Um, But, you know, but it's expensive for that co-packer to make each one. So the price is already pretty high. Um, Could she make it for less money? Um, Probably in a shared space? Yes. Um, So there isn't like one number. There's not like a 10 or 20,000 units. It's not really standardized. That's typical. It, it's you kind of have to weigh all your options. I mean, if you're someone who really doesn't have time or doesn't does not see yourself doing production, then you're you're not even going to consider that in the beginning. You're going to launch a product, finding a co-packer right from the start. So, what do you think the food industry can improve upon to make manufacturing easier for small and extra small brands? I think they could make it easier by. Um, <laughs> it's so like co-manufacturers and distributors, which are going to be usually a part of your um, business at some point as you scale, um, but they're elusive, you know, they're, they're hard to find. So I I don't, you know, I guess there are many food manufacturers who, who want to be elusive. Um, They don't, they're not looking to add, new products necessarily. And then there are others who, who just, you know, they're, they're constantly manufacturing. They don't have um, marketing people. They don't have someone who can answer the phone and ask, answer questions. Um, There's a, there's a company in Round Rock who does um, in Greek um, manufactures ingredients um, that a lot of people, food businesses utilize. And um, like, I had a conversation with them recently. They, they get like maybe 60 inquiries a week. And so they can't even handle that kind of volume. So um, what can food manufacturers do? I don't, I don't really know if there's a solution. If there's a solution, I don't know what it is. Have better marketing and have more employees (laughs) to be able to handle all of that. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, cool. ideally that'd be great, but you know, yeah. they're already usually challenged with their own, um, labor challenges, you know, just the, the, those, those roles are usually, um, the key employees are on the floor doing the manufacturing, right? Um, so it, it's why, it's why they are elusive. It's because it's just not a piece the customer service uh, piece is not, I guess, that valuable to them because the demand is is there. I mean, I guess if if every if everyone really started bringing their production in house and the co packers started losing business, then maybe that would turn around. Gosh, I I mean, this whole the manufacturing piece is is something that a lot of people struggle with. At least the conversations we have, and it it is. It's wild, um, but we've we've hit that on the he- the head a lot. So I'm curious, what are some of the other challenges that uh, the brands you consult with are are dealing with? And and if you have any solutions, by all mm-hmm. means. <laughs> um, some of them are really um, really not prepared financially. Um, for the the amount of capital it really takes to um, grow and to maintain, so um, that's a challenge. Especially right now, where ingredient when ingredient prices are higher than ever, and um, packaging is hard to find. Um, so you know, hopefully, we'll get past 
this pandemic um, supply chain shortage and challenges, and then we'll be back to normal, which is still challenging. Um, but everything is in flux right now. So um, it's really even hard for me to advise, you know, my clients who are, who are launching products and, and, and get and, you know, just jars are not only hard to find, but really expensive and it makes it, you know, it doesn't really always make sense to, to launch this time, but someone who wants to launch a product is, um, is, is going to launch their product. You know, they're, they're, um, pretty committed to that concept. Um, and then the other piece, um, you know, is, is, is everyone wants to use sustainable packaging. Um, but again, that's pretty hard to find and it's pretty hard to find affordable packaging. So, um, but it's, it's really what we have to do it all together. We all have to do it together. The entrepreneurs are the ones who will, can go out, some of them, and, and really dig around till they find the right solution. I mean, the supply chain issues that we're having, I, I can't imagine being in logistics for that right now. What do you foresee um, happening do you do you think it's gonna get better? Do you think there's gonna be new innovation because of it? I think there's new innovation now. Absolutely. Um, I try to stay as engaged as I as I am available to on um, several LinkedIn groups who are discussing intently and discussing packaging solutions. So there are people out there really trying to solve that and connect dots for everybody else. Um, and that's just one example. Um, there are people you can find like that's that goes back to that networking, you know, being really savvy and realizing that, um, you know, there are um, communities you can tap into and really should be tapping into to bounce ideas off of and find solutions for that are on LinkedIn Facebook groups, et cetera. But um, I don't have the solutions for all of this. <laughs> We'd be really, really successful women if we had the, the solution <laughs> to this problem. Um, exactly. Not that we aren't successful women, let's be real. Right. right. Um, so you talked a little bit about how you spent really 10 years every single day going to a place like Central Market. And it's really, we get on the grocery, sh like lost in, not lost on. We'll go to the grocery store and like, that's one of our favorite pastimes to just go and look at all of the products and see what innovation there is, what new products there are. And it's like all really, really exciting and fluffy and beautiful. Then we go to their social pages, we go to their websites and it like looks Thing. But we know that like on the back end, nothing's perfect. I, I, there's a lot of like comparison and shiny object syndrome that happens. But do you see like on the back end, behind the scenes, are you seeing some issues past like that glamour of being on shelves and having this amazing brand? You mean challenges or positive pieces? Challenges. That Oh, I would challenges. say challenges, yeah, because it's uh, there's a lot of positives that are really apparent. But um, yeah. what do you think? Like, are some struggles the founders have behind the scenes? Okay, first of all, just the the grittiness of having a food company and and um, being in the kitchen is you know is hard work, and um, you're physically tired, um, and so like. I remember seeing brands um, in my kitchen who um, maybe even had been in the SKU Accelerator program or other programs, opportunities that they had been um, offered, and they would spend their days in those programs and then come into the kitchen and just like be so exhausted mentally, but then they have to start the physical part of it. So, so that's one piece of it. You know, when you have a product and you have to get the product to the store after you've spent all those hours in the kitchen making the product, um, then you have to get in your car and drive it to the retailer. And sometimes that usually retailers, you know, if you're self-distributing, need you to come in the back door. And that's the times that you can do that is from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. before the customers are really 
So, you know, again, that's, that's not really a lot of fun. Um, you know, just the stresses of, you know, getting a purchase order and being able to fulfill that purchase order and then having to wait to be paid for that purchase order um, and all the delays and the games that can be involved in that are really, really stressful. Um, sometimes it's just a, the simple thing, like just knowing that you have just created a product and you spent all this time getting to that point, And then you, you want to take, you know, which real, t- which retailer is right for your product. You've already figured that out, but you can't get them to return a call, answer an email. Um, you can't get it in the door. So, but you know, there's a lot of um, no's, you know, um, it used to be a little easier to approach a retailer certain retailers than it is now. And then on the other side, there's um, a lot more local grocery stores now than we ever had before. So that's always evolving. And you can go outside of Austin and find more retailers to carry your product. But again, you have to, you have to make the product, put it in your car and drive it there or hire someone to do that for you. Um, It just can be exhausting. Yeah. So do you see a lot of burnout uh, with the brands that you work with? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine. And what, I mean, what's your piece of advice when they just can't do it anymore? You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, I, I definitely recommend to brands that before they even launch to sort of have in their mind that concept of having an exit strategy. Um, because, I mean, do you see yourself doing this for five or 10 years? I mean, let's say you haven't progressed out of doing your own production. That's what you're doing and you're physically so tired. But, you know, what are your options if you want to change careers? You know, do you just shut the business and walk away, which I've seen happen? Um, You know, can I sell my company? Yes. Um, but realizing that also takes a while. Sometimes people hit the wall before um, and then they're like impatient, like, no, I want to just call someone and offer, you know, <laughs> they want to buy my business, I'm sure. It's like, no, that's going to take you at least another year to potentially find someone who may be interested in purchasing your business. And then there's going to be a negotiating process and that's going to be very stressful too. Um or finding someone on your team already, I see this happen, um, wh- who is really engaged and, and then, you know, they're interested in actually taking over the company. That can happen as well. And if you nurture, you know, your relationships with some of your own key employees, then that's also a possibility. But it is something that a founder should think of when they're launching, like, okay, how am I going to get out of this? Because sometimes getting out of a business you've started, I've done it before, um, you know, is really hard. Are most uh, of the brands that you work with, there is there in-game selling? Is that generally people's goals? So many people now are on the, they have this idea that I'm going to launch this brand that no one ever thought of before. And then some big food company is going to acquire it and I'm going to get rich. (laughs) Just isn't the way it works. Um, I wonder what the percentage of that is. I would love to know. (laughs) I don't know what the percentage (laughs) is, but it, it isn't very, it isn't very much. Although it's perfectly fine to, you know, have, to admire and learn from those who have had that experience. And as we all know, in Austin, that has happened um, multiple times and it it is inspiring for sure. And there's a lot to learn from those people, but it is not the norm. So, you know, often founders launch alone um, and then, you know, finding a consultant to help them is helpful. Finding, people, other like-minded businesses to collaborate with is helpful, but it is also helpful to, you know, start with a business partner. And then again, you know, that can be challenging because maybe they haven't found the right business partner in the beginning. And then after a while, if they realize that that isn't going to work out, then it's hard to separate from that business partner. Yeah. I I mean, I, 
the running a CPG brand isn't exactly a lifestyle business unless you're able to hand it off and have someone else run it because you got to grind <laughs> in this industry. So I was just curious um, what the goal was for most of your brands. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, um, I think people have more short-term goals than they have long-term goals. Um, maybe that's just our human nature, right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a beautiful industry. I mean, you get to make food and beverages for mm-hmm. people to enjoy. So um yeah, that, I, just I mean, that in itself is, is wonderful. Yep. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And that's, it's very rewarding. And, mm-hmm. and there's value in, um, you learn so much. Um, you learn, I, I would say at Capital Kitchens, you know, I would look around and I'd see everybody really working hard. And I say, we're all kind of, everyone's kind of pretending to be running a food company, but really what everyone really is doing underneath is they're becoming better humans because they're learning to work with each other and to collaborate and to be considerate. And they're learning about business and they're learning about sales and they're learning about food safety. And um, there's so much to, to gain really. And it, whether their food business is successful in the end. Um, I mean, the, of course, we want that to happen. But if it doesn't, then there's there was definitely value in the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And we obviously want to encourage anybody who has the dream to build something that they're passionate about um, to do it, to try, because you have one life to live. And if this is something that you want to be passionate about, do your best. And like we said, you got to grind. Uh, but as long as you know that and you don't expect it to be like an easy ride, especially these people that are coming from different industries and coming into CPG and have no experience and have no idea how robust it, it actually is, um, I think they should go for it. But I really love that. So we were talking about a little bit of the negatives of like, if you do decide to um, bail, <laughs> but what they can gain personally and what they can learn about themselves is super powerful. So um, yes. thanks for reminding us. <laughs> yes, yes. Awesome. Well, Trish, it was such a joy to get to talk to you. Um, we really enjoyed learning more about how you got started and what you're seeing in the industry now. But would you like to leave the audience with a link or a call to action or a final statement? Sure. Um, I have, um, so I, I do consulting and I really, um, you know, I'm kind of the person that will kind of hold your hand <laughs> along the way and kind of be the business partner that you don't have to break up with eventually. I'll just help you, um, you know, take as many steps, um, thoughtful steps forward as possible. So my company is called Launch Point Culinary Services. Um, I'm, I ha- my website is launchpointculinary.com. Um, I put some resources up there. I have a blog I've just kind of started to get more serious about, and I'll start uh, putting more practical resources up there. And um, I run a little Instagram product review page that's kind of more for fun called CPG Find. And, um, you know, you can see me around town at, at a various networking CPG events and accelerators and incubators. So I kind of make the scene, make the rounds. So, um, but, and I, I'm, um, love to chat with people about their concept. And so it, I'm pretty much just a email phone call away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Trish. And we'll be sure and link all of those in the show notes as well. So you can contact Trish and y'all can talk food and Bev. (laughs) Well, thank you guys so much for reaching out and interviewing me today. Thank you. Ooh, My Social Circle is a CPG agency-driven podcast based out of Austin, Texas. We're excited to share more behind the scene insights, chats with industry leaders, and whatever else we learn along the way. Follow us on Instagram at Umai Marketing or check out our website, umaimarketing.com. Catch you back here soon.